everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Lakewood Public Library's virtual Meet the Author series. We're excited to talk to author and illustrator Dirk Backdurf about his recent book, Kent State, Four Dead in Ohio. Dirk has received many awards and accolades with this book, including an Alex Award, and was named one of the best books of the year by the New York Times, NPR, Library Journal, and many, many more. Uh, you can buy Dirk's Durf's, uh, book on his website, or you can check out your uh, a copy of his book at your local library. Thanks so much. Dirk, take it away. <laughs> okay. Thanks for having me. I'm just going to leap right into this uh, slideshow I have, and, and we'll get started because no one wants to look at me. Um, so yes, indeed, this is Kent State, Four Dead in Ohio. It is a graphic novel, which is a bit of an unusual take uh, for this story, but you know that's my chosen art form, so that's that's what I want. This is a story that I have been carrying with me. Um, well, why can't I advance? Literally, my whole life. I grew up in Richfield, to the south of due south of Lakewood, and in May 1970, just before the events at Kent State, the Ohio National Guard invaded my hometown. They were sent in to break up a Teamster strike, which had paralyzed the trucking industry throughout Northeast Ohio at that time. And the governor um, sent in the soldiers to bust up the strike because it started to get ugly, as Teamster strikes tend to do. So this was a, had a profound impact on me at age 10. You know, suddenly I'm living in Mayberry and suddenly it's under military occupation. And it's just it just really kind of uh, set a chain of uh, intellectual growth in motion in this in this, you know, small town kid. And I know this sounds like total crap, but here's 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 some proof. Um, oh, here's the guard actually in Richfield. So you see it. Uh, lining the streets of my hometown with bayonets drawn, facing off against my neighbors, essentially. Um, and this is a political cartoon I drew in 1970 at age 10. I know this is obnoxiously precocious, but uh, my first incarnation in comics was actually as a political cartoonist, first at college at Ohio State and then as a pro for a couple of years. Um, and I did some for the Plain Dealer too when I first moved to town. So it, it's kind of a straight line for me from you know this 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 event in 1970 to becoming an author and a, and a and a cartoonist and you know everybody has these these events that you know spur something in them intellectually and this was mine so for this reason I've always carried this story around with me and it's such a great story um, and I felt there was a real opportunity here as a to depict it as a visual narrative because it's never really been done before. I mean, we have great photos from, from the Kent State shootings, but that's, you know, that's not narrative. There's one bad TV movie that was made, I think in 1980, that is really not good at all. Other than that, it was completely wide open. So I felt there was an opportunity here for me to present this story in a new way and add some visual clarity to what is a pretty confusing event. So the story begins, uh, my story actually begins on May 1st, 1970 with you know, peaceful demonstration on campus. Um, that night, anti-war sentiment really overflows and it was just part of the, the time. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and there's some window smashing spree in downtown Kent, mostly the banks, the students, busted all the windows of the banks, the banks were funding the war, blah, blah, blah. So that was the, uh, the reasoning there. The following night, another group of students, um, actually mostly the same students, attacked the ROTC building on campus. ROTC is the Reserve Officer Training Corps that was a college program still around that trains uh, junior officers for the military, all branches of the service, in fact. And the students at the time viewed it as the Pentagon, you know, infiltrating uh, a campus setting. So ROTC buildings were targets throughout the country during this era. And at Kent State, they set theirs on fire. They burned it. It was an old wooden shed and it went up in like a torch. 
And at that moment, the guard poured onto campus because Governor Rhodes now had a, who was running for an election, by the way, he was running for a primary election and trailing. Uh, he was kind of an authoritarian strongman, dominated politics in the state for a quarter century. Um, and he was, he was looking for a way to make up ground against an opponent. He was running for an open US Senate seat. The primary was on Tuesday, May 5th. So the events at Kent State happened just before that, the days before that. So, you know, the Teamsters, unruly Teamsters were a great optic for him to be a tough guy. Well, rampaging, uh, rioting student protesters in 1970 were an even juicier target because they were the number one boogeyman of the era. So Rhodes sent in the guard in overwhelming force. Um, and it just escalated from there. Uh, the, the, the following two nights were ones of really just this uh, violent military crackdown. Students were bayoneted, uh, gassed right and left. Uh, it was, uh, um, and then on May, Monday, May 4, there was a peaceful rally on campus with about 400 students and the guard moved in and gassed them, chased them, bayoneted them, clubbed them. Here we are showing the actions, movements of the guard. I mean, you can read about this in the book. I mean, the great thing about my art form is that I can add this visual clarity to what was kind of a confusing movement in the guard and with the student protesters. But, you know, graphic narrative, um, you can really lay this out clearly. And then the pivotal moment for still. And up there, here is the, uh, Here's an actual shot of right after the shooting. So the guard is here. This we're looking in the opposite direction. The guard is here at the top of the hill. You can barely make them out. And these are all the students scattering. You can see some of them have already fallen. And the bulk of the students are even further. They're in the foreground because there's a, a road there called Midway Drive where a lot of kids go from classroom to uh, back to the dorms. And that was full of students. And this is what the guard fired into. <clears throat> and I do not spare the violence of this event. Um, I thought it was important to show it because, you know, this is something that's kind of been glossed over. Just what it looks like when bullets, copper jacketed bullets over an inch long, fired from M1s, which is a gun so powerful it can pump one of those bullets clean through a foot thick tree trunk and still kill the person on the other side of it. What happens when that's fired into a crowd of students? Um, you know, because there was a whole, in the aftermath of Kent State, much as we see now in, in some of the protests and, and reactions today, there was an attitude, um, it was particularly prevalent in 1970 as well, we should have shot more of them. To end this period of unrest, we should have killed a thousand students. Well, okay, you believe that, here's what it looks like. And it's a very powerful uh, ending to this book. Now to understand this era, it's really difficult, but you have to remember, this is the, the depths of the Vietnam War. And the body bags were just streaming home at this point. The war was a hopeless quagmire. It was ripping the country apart. And remember the Vietnam War was a, was a war that was fought by draftees. It was not as all subsequent wars have been fought by volunteers. An entire generation of students, of students, of young men, back then it was only men, um, lived in a state of constant anxiety of getting that notice in the mail, report to so-and-so a place at so-and-so a time for induction into the armed forces. And a couple months later, they could be trudging through a jungle in Vietnam, wondering if they were going to see the dawn. It, it was the bane of this generation, and it absolutely added gasoline to the anti-war movement of the late 60s, early 70s. Millions of kids flooded the streets demanding that the Pentagon and the White House end this war. And this was met with um, a fierce um, put down by the authorities. This is actually Ohio State. This photo here is from Ohio State uh, during the same weekend as Kent State. Uh, <clears throat> 
if you've seen some of the new things on uh, Netflix lately, like the trial of Chicago seven or the Fred Hampton piece, you know, that, you know, what this period was like, it was, it was, I mean, it's hard to, to imagine, you know, here having lived through 2020, but it, it's still considered the most contentious period in U.S. history outside of the Civil War. It was like 2020 on steroids. And it really seemed like the, the country was absolutely devolving into Civil War. So that was the, and on top of that, you had Ermit unrest. This is Glenville in Cleveland which would happened in 1968. So you had this series of, you know, year after year after year of escalating conflict that was taking place all over the country and all over the world. <clears throat> now, when you approach a story, you know, you have to sit down for a minute as an author and decide, okay, what's my story about? There's been a lot of stuff done on Kent State over the years, dozens of books. And very early on, I decided that the way I wanted to tell this story is to focus on the four the four kids who were killed on May 4th. Um, Sandy Scheuer, Bill Schroeder, Jeff Miller, and Allison Krauss. Four very remarkable kids. The youngest was 19. She had just turned 19. Uh, the oldest was 21. All, uh, all Ohio kids except Jeff. They were all from Ohio. Uh, I think the nearest one to Lakewood would be Bill, Bill Schroeder. He was from Lorraine on the west side. Allison and Sandy were from the east side. So um, actually, Allison was a little farther out. She was out in uh, Butler County, um, but all Ohioans anyways. So I decided to portray the story purely through their eyes and their experiences. And so piecing together this narrative by researching what they were doing each day. And I was lucky enough that each of them was present, if not participating, at least present at every event that happens during these four days of conflict. And I boiled the story down to those four days because I really wanted to narrow the focus. My belief is, is that when you make history personal, when you make it about people, we're caught up in events rather than about, you know, just the events themselves. That's where you find the emotion and the humanity of a story. And, you know, this, this book, um, it packs a wallop at the end. It's a real, when these kids are cut down, it's a real gut punch. You feel it. I, want, I wanted people to feel it the way that the students of 1970 felt it and still feel it, having talked to so many of them, interviewing so many of them. <clears throat> and after that, I mean, I can't obviously interview the four, but I, I tried to get as close to them as I can. And I just contacted anyone who knew them. Classmates, roommates were particularly, that was great. I didn't talk too much to the families um, because, you know, I wanted this to be about the college, their college lives. And families really aren't privy to that, you know? I mean, think back to when you were in college. I mean, I know I didn't tell my parents anything about what I was up to at Ohio State. So I, I really wanted to get close to their contemporaries. And I did just hundreds of interviews. I spent about two years just purely researching this book. Um, and then another two years to draw it, so four years total. But I kept researching even as I was um, uh, drawing. And in fact, I, like, I landed a, a key interview with one of Allison's friends um like a week before the book was due and changed some dialogue because of that so it was like right up until the end I could have kept going I mean I could have researched this book for another year easy but I was out of time um and spent a lot of time of course in the May 4 collection which I understand is uh is uh, going to be on display at the library it's a wonderful collection by the way I would uh, really urge you all to check that out <clears throat> Here's my, here's my file drawer for Kent State. I mean, it just kept growing and growing and growing. Um, the tough thing was, you know, to come up with a visual representation, there's not a lot of um, visual evidence from that time, believe it or not. We had a different relationship with photography. You know, we weren't, we were still using film and crappy little cameras and not, it was expensive. It was time consuming. Not a lot of people were wasting film on, on just shooting casual, casual photos, not like today where you hold up a cell phone and take a thousand photos in the blink of an eye. Um, it was a totally different relationship. So there's very, very few photos of these four. 
from, from which I could work, you know, to try to, this is like one of the only photos of Jeff from that time and to, to come up with like a visual representation of him. It's not important that I be entirely accurate. I just wanted to capture something of him and then for the reader to be able to immediately identify him throughout the story. I mean, those are the two important things. In fact, this photo just emerged like last month. No one has seen this since 1970 when it was taken. And it's, it's uh, and I was really pleased to see when I looked at this photo, you know, to see his features and his hair that I got his, I guessed, pure guesswork getting as close as I did. Um, recreating the campus and the town was another challenge because this is a period piece and it's a very small window in time, right? I mean, we're talking four days in May, 1970. And the campus, this is the campus today. This is the shooting site. So this, I'm taking this shot from where the guard was standing. The students were all at the bottom of the hill there, way behind those cars, in fact. Um, the trees are obviously bigger. Uh, that was a bit of a problem because initially I drew the trees <laughs> the current size. <laughs> And then I look back at some period photos and went, oh, wait a minute. Of course, the trees were 50 years smaller. And so I had to redraw some scenes. It's just little things like that that'll trip you up. So recreating this campus, um, it, was, it took a lot of detective work. This is a university map from 1971. So these are great because it shows all the buildings where they were. And can, you know, really lays out the campus beautifully. <clears throat> what was there, what wasn't. That's just as important because there's so much has been added on. And then I could track down individual photos of the various buildings and slowly start to piece this together. So when you read this book, I mean, I put in tons of research. When you read this book, it's pretty accurate. If you see a background scene, you know, the buildings in the background are accurate and they're accurately depicted. Um, I, I really took a lot of pride in that. Uh, the town was another problem. Uh, this is Water Street, which is the bar district downtown Kent. Now, the top photo is from 1970. The bottom photo is as it is today. So you see it's completely different. And it was really tough tracking down photo reference of, of downtown Kent because, you know, it's just this crappy little bar district in a college town and who cares? So no one was taking photos of this stuff. Um, it took a long time. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about process. I'm actually be talking too fast here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow through this talk faster than I anticipated. Sorry about that. Uh, I hope you have some questions. Uh, so let's talk about process. Um, I started with a script and started, you know, blocking in the story. Like I said, I had my concept. I was telling it through the eyes of the four. So I had these four uh, threads to keep track of. Actually, it was five because I added the account of a young guardsman that I stumbled across because um, I wanted that perspective as well, you know, because it was so different than the experience of the students. And of the students, um, Allison and Jeff took part in some of the protests, not all of the protests. Uh, Sandy and Bill were not participants at all, they were just walking to class which is one of the tragedies of this event. Half the kids who were shot were just walking to class with they had books in their hands um, because the university was open because Governor Rhodes refused to close the university until things calmed down because that would be giving in to the student radicals and it didn't give him the optic that he wanted, which was to be a tough guy. You can't be a tough guy if the campus is empty. So this, the campus was open, classes were in session, and those kids were put in mortal danger. And, you know, the politicians simply didn't care. Um, and that was Kent State in a nutshell. <clears throat> now, after I have my story where I pretty much want it, and like I said, I did a rough script, uh, this is, I then moved to the thumbnail phase and thumbnails are, they're just roughs. That's another name for them. This is on, you know, 11 and a half, eight and a half by 11 copy paper. I make these things. And they're just like rough pages where I put in 
all the dialogue and I, and I sketch in what I want. And this is how, this is writing to me because I'm always thinking together, you know, words, dialogue, and the images, because in my art form, they are, they are absolutely linked and you can't have one without the other. So this is how I write. <clears throat> I know you really can't decipher this, but um, from there I go to a tight pencil and this is on a bigger sheet of paper. I think I am somewhere, but you probably can't see me. Um, and this is the most time consuming part of the process because this is where I pour in all that research I've done, all that visual research. So this is where I draw in all the buildings and draw in the period clothes and the period cars and what happens and various people. <clears throat> so if you look at the rough and then the pencil, I mean, you can see, I know you, no one can decipher this but me, but once you get to the pencil, you can see where I'm going. It's, it's pretty accurate. And the pencil, now I pencil everything all the way through. I mean, you do, you do these in waves, like you do, this is what, a 280 page book. So I do 280 pages of, uh, of roughs. I do 280 pages of pencils and then 280 pages of inks. And you just keep punching them out. Uh, it's very time consuming. Um, you know, the roughs come together pretty quickly though you do have to work out some kinks and that's where you work out a lot of the problems with the storytelling. Um, the pencils, that's when it all grinds to a crawl. I can probably do two on a really good day, maybe three pencils a day. And that's a pretty long day, maybe 10 hours of drawing. So, you know, two pages a day, it's a 280 page book. You can start to, to understand why it took two, two full years to draw. Um, Graphic novels are, are, they're very labor intensive, especially my kind of graphic novels because <clears throat> people like me who do everything themselves, and there's a lot of names for these. Some people call them indie graphic novels. It's not really an applicable term because I mean, my publisher is Abrams, which is one of the biggest publishers in the world. So how indie is that? But it's not like, you know, the comics of say Marvel and DC or the superhero comics where you have an entire team of people doing a, producing those things. You have a writer, you have an artist, you have an inker, you have a colorist, you have someone who does the lettering. In my type of comics, these very personal comics, um, everything you see was put there by hand by me. So it, it's a very individual piece of work. And there, you know, there are a lot of strengths to that. Um, the disadvantage is that it's, it takes a long time. So after the pencil, then I, oh, here you go. Well, I meant to put this in earlier. Here's, here's an example of, uh, this is one of the few photos from the Water Street riot. Now this is, this chapter here is the Water Street riot on Friday night, the bank where they attacked the banks and busted the windows. This is one of the only photos. So this is what my art form can bring to this story because I can create these images out of accounts, out of news reports, out of police reports and other things. I can create images that don't exist otherwise. And I think that adds, uh, getting back to that, that narrative clarity, that, that's what I can bring to the story. Um, here's the ink for this. So you've got the pencil and then the inks. And then I, you know, at this point, everything's scanned into the computer and cleaned up, and then I add the finishes. So it's a four-step process from, uh, here we go back here, from rough to pencil, to ink, to finish. <clears throat> um, I draw pretty intuitively. I mean, I don't spend a lot of time on comics theory or, you know, I, I just want to get it down fast and, and go with my instincts. And they've, they've served me pretty well so far. So I'll, I'll keep doing that. Now, here's a two page. Uh, this is what I call a two page spread because the way you read a book, of course, is you open it up. So you see those two pages together. That's your first, going to be your first impression of the story as it unfolds. So those two pages have to work together. So usually I do the thumbnails together on the same sheet of paper. Um, and then beyond that, you have to link the whole, you know, the narrative for the whole scene. 
and then the whole chapter and then the whole arc of the story i mean it does it does take some you have to think about it for a while and and get it straight in your head and this just comes from a lifetime at this point a lifetime of making comics you know i mean i, I just have my own my own way of thinking my own my own way of, of executing this stuff and uh, yeah, it comes pretty seamlessly to me but it is it is it can be complicated so here we have the rough and again you probably can't see really tell what's happening here but here's the pencil now this is uh, the guard in front of the blazing ROTC building on Saturday night <clears throat> so you can see it's fairly accurate I mean I don't change a lot and that's the finish. And that's when it all, you know, when you add the ink, that's when it real it all really comes together. So we go from rough to pencil to finish. One, two, three. And it looks a lot of, I mean, this is these are this was a really easy page, you know, that comes together beautifully. And I think it's it's pretty dramatic. I was really pleased with the way this came out. I mean, as far back as the rough phase, I'm thinking, oh yeah, this is gonna be a good page. This is gonna be a good spread. And indeed it was. Um, a lot of dramatic lighting in this book. So that was, you know, something that I worked on. And man, it's, it's a very dramatic story. It's surprisingly suspenseful considering how we, we know how it ends. I mean, every Ohioan knows how it ended. Um, but it, it feels, uh, what, the, the, what I was shooting for, well, it's not the, I probably shouldn't use that uh, turn of phrase. Um, what I was trying to achieve was um, the feeling that, that this is a runaway train because that's how it was described to me over and over again by the people who were there. It's just like, you know, we knew it was gonna end badly but no one could stop it. And so I think that's very evident in this story as it goes along, even though we know how it ends, you know, it just keeps building and building and building in suspense until the final horrible climax. <clears throat> now here's an example of me uh, me having trouble with a scene and this is you know the iconic scene i mean this is the the photo of marianne vecchio screaming over the body of jeff miller um who was shot in the mouth and killed instantly uh just taken by john philo who was a student photographer at kent state at the time uh, he won a pulitzer prize for this photo it's one of the most famous news photos of the 20th century and probably of all time. <clears throat> but to me, it presented a problem because, you know, how do I depict this, this moment? Now I've seen other cases where there is an iconic moment like this that's being recreated. And sometimes they, they like try to capture exactly the image. For example, in that bad TV movie I was talking about, about Kent State, when it comes to this, they have this moment and the action actually freezes and all of the actors are in these same positions. And, you know, they freeze it for a couple seconds and then the story moves on. And I just thought that was really contrived and lame. And I didn't want to do that. So how do you, how do I, you know, uh, recreate this, this moment? Now, here's the rough and you, and, it's not happening for me here. I mean, I'm just not getting it. So uh, I actually worked this scene out in the pencil phase. And here's what I came up with. Now this is three pages now. And I hope you guys can uh, see all three pages. Sometimes it doesn't, uh, oops. Come on, let's go back, here we are. Um, it starts on the previous page. You know, this is the previous page. And I decided what I was going to do was focus not on the image, but focus on the screen. Because over and over, what was described to me by the people who were actually in the parking lot um, was that after the shooting, after that horrible fusillade, there was this heavy silence, just like total silence for it seemed endless and then screams and the screams just amplified and then that's all you heard and i thought well i'll try to capture that because the one thing that comics can do that no other art form can do is portray sound as a graphic element that's 
that belongs to us in our art form. And so that's what I'm focusing on here. You can see on the, the page on the left, you know, by the time you get to the bottom panel, that's where the scream starts with Mary Ann first uh, bending over Jeff and that horrible river of blood coming out of his head. And then the scream just carries over onto the next page because this is the spread here on the next page. So the scream carry, carries over to the top of the right-hand page and then down. And that's how I decided to portray it. And uh, I think it came out pretty well. Let's see if I can get, yeah, here's the finish. Um, but again, it's, it's a challenge. And the book is full of challenge. I mean, it just, this book just really kicked the crap out of me, honestly, I mean, drawing this book. I've never taken on a project this complex. Um, the drawing was very, very difficult. You know, you have crowd scenes, you have military scenes, you have night scenes, you have night crowd scenes, night crowd military scenes. It was, it was, uh, it was daunting. But you know, I think I, I think I pulled it off. <clears throat> okay, that's my spiel. How am I doing on time? Forty minutes, a little, a little long, but. I didn't know that. That's that's fine. I think captivated the entire time. Um, I just have a couple of questions for sure. you, if you don't mind. No. Um, I know that you did lots and lots of research for this book, and it, it definitely shows. Was there anything that you found out in your research that you were surprised about? Um, yeah, quite a bit, actually. Um, I'm not sure I want to give all of it away for those of you who haven't read the book. Uh, there's a couple revelations in the book that nobody else has. And that came from talking to the roommates of some of the students involved, because a lot of these people have never uh, spoken before, believe it or not. There's still a, a, a lot of, I mean, the guard doesn't speak at all, most of them, for obvious reasons. And um, the students, uh, you know, they went and they kind of went under, you know, they dove under the bushes in 1970 and they really have not emerged and some of them have a lot of trouble you know conjuring these things up I mean they've got PTSD you know um, I mean it's a tough thing to to literally you know what this Neil Young song says what would you do if you saw her dead on the ground well these kids did see her dead on the ground you know I mean they really are combat victims um but they talked to me and uh, I was lucky that I was able to get introductions from people that I know, you know, this is the advantage of being local. I am born and raised here. I've lived here my whole life, pretty much, at least in Ohio. And, you know, people recognize that and they respond to that. So I know a lot of people from Kent State and from that time, because, you know, in the arts community and the music community and the, you know, literature community. Kent was a big art center that produced a lot of people. So, um, you know, you meet these people and they knew people that introduced me to other people. And so I was able to kind of uh, gain access that not a lot of authors can because of, of being local. So, yeah, but there are re uh, revelations in the book. Absolutely. All right. All right. Readers uh, definitely pick it up. Um, just just one more question, kind of kind of along the same lines. Um, you know, obviously you, you went into this, you know, knowing the story your whole life, and obviously, you know, coming to an understanding, you know, as you've grown older and under, you know, understanding what's happening in history. Um, did your beliefs change at all from when you started this book and from when you um, beliefs in what 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 happened and, and how the events unfolded? Um, not too much because this is a story I've always followed. So I worked for many years in newspapers. So, you know, I mean, I was privy to the reporting on this story, which took place over the years and particularly in Akron, where it's always been a big story. Uh, you know, Akron being the closest, uh, big city to, to Kent and the Akron Beacon Journal won a Pulitzer for its coverage of, of May 4. So, and you know, I know a lot of people who, who work there who were actually covering the event. So, I mean, this is something that I've always had kind of uh, inside baseball information about. So it's always been fairly clear in my mind. There was still a lot of research to do, um, you know, on the whole, uh, particularly of, uh, of the guard 
and how you know that worked. I mean, that was not something that I really understood particularly well. And also of radical politics in 1970, which is very complex, constantly changing as there were purges and splits and all the stuff that usually happens with radical politics. And, um, but that was all fun for me, you know, it was, it was fun to explore that and try to track it down and, and come up with all this information on that stuff. I'm still doing it. I mean, I haven't really stopped just because I'm so interested in, and, but no, I, I was pretty clear on, on where I was going with this story, but, uh, you know, I was really focusing on those, those five threads that I was following and trying to, to piece the story together through their eyes. And that, that was where the detective work came in. Thank you very much. Do you have anything else to add before we go? No. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today. And I urge all of our viewers to check out the book and come and see the exhibit. Um, it's on display right now at the library. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.